Okay, welcome to the Game or Die podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Moore. And it is a new year. It is the year 2023. And unfortunately, over Christmas, I got a little bit sick. I actually came down with the flu in the last week of the year. So I was not able to record. I just got my voice back about a day ago. Uh, so I normally try and do uh, a Christmas or uh, New Year's Eve podcast for Game of the Year. Over the last several years that I've been doing this podcast, unfortunately, I just got really sick. And I was not up to the task of sitting here recording a very long podcast like I normally do for the end of the year, which I love doing. I, I enjoy talking about video games a ton anyways, but the Game of the Year episodes are always some of my favorites just because I get to reflect on the year in uh, my life in gaming and really kind of take stock of what games I liked, what games I didn't like, and just reflect on everything that I did throughout the year. Uh, and last year I did something where I recapped the games that I played through and finished and beat. And I really enjoy doing that kind of looking back on the games that going in chronological order from January 1st until, uh, December 31st, just kind of going, Oh yeah, that's right. I played that game and I really had fun. Oh, I played that game. And that guy game kind of sucked and I finished it for whatever reason. So I'm going to do kind of the same thing. So the beginning of this podcast is going to be a recap of the year. And then uh, at the middle point, I'm going to switch gears and actually talk about my top 10 games of the year as well. So a little bit of everything uh, for everyone. So to start off with January 1st of 2022, I played a game called Lake. And it was on Game Pass. And <clears throat> last year, I really tried at the beginning of the year to play more games than I played the previous year because 2021 was a really crazy year in my life because I moved across the country. I now live in Tennessee. I used to live in uh, California. And moving across the country is a big, big deal. And it was right, you know, in the middle of the pandemic and everything like that too. And it was just a very hectic time. Also, because I didn't just move across the country, I traveled across the country throughout the entire year as well because of work. So I just had a crazy, crazy year, uh, 2021, and I wanted to play more games than I did uh, for 2022. Unfortunately, that really didn't happen. Um, I'll kind of go into this uh, just a little bit here, but this year, this last year, 2022, was the absolute bar none worst year for gaming in the history of gaming. Uh, you might say the video game crash year uh, because of Atari probably was worse, but for new game releases and the way people played games, the way that I played games, the games that came out, it was just atrocious. I was pissed throughout most of this year because nothing good came out, like very little good came out. So I'm just going to go through and talk about this stuff as uh, I played it, and I really tried at the start to play more video games this last year in 2022. The first game I played was a little game on Game Pass called Lake, and you play this lady who is just kind of, it's, it's a period piece, so it takes place in the early 80s, and you are this girl who is just tired of her life in the big city, you're a computer programmer and just want to want to get away for a little bit. So you head up to your old house where your parents still live in this little lake town community. And I actually lived in a very similar community uh, over the last decade of my life. Right before I moved out here to Tennessee, I lived up in Lake Arrowhead of California, Lake Arrowhead, Big Bear, Twin Peaks, all those little tiny uh, lake communities, mountain communities in Southern California. And it's a very different type of lifestyle. It's a lot slower than down the mountain. 
but still pretty chaotic uh, with modern sensibilities and things like that. You know, life in the 2020s are just crazy and chaotic, especially with the pandemic and everything that happened too. It was just, it was overwhelming. We're talking about the 80s here. So technology is around, but it's not as advanced as it is now. So when the character gets away to her old house and her old lifestyle and, and meets all these new, uh, people that she grew up with and then moved away from and comes back to them. It was really, really interesting. So I really enjoyed and, and kind of had a little bit of, I know what you're going for while playing this game. And, and I saw a lot of similarities of my life in that game as well. So I really enjoyed it. I think it was a little bit too long than it needed to be. Uh, for the fact that the main thing that you're supposed to be doing is reconnecting with old friends, uh, kind of seeing where everyone else is in life compared to you, and then trying to kind of regather yourself. And there's branching paths and character interactions that you can take, which I thought was really, really interesting and cool, but it, the main game mechanic is this uh, thing where your dad is a mail carrier. He works for the post office and he delivers mail to the community. And so your parents, while you're there, they say, hey, we're going to go to Florida. Uh, you, uh, can, uh, you're going to take over, your dad says, you're going to take over my job. You're going to be the mail, mail carrier for the two weeks that you're there. And then um, I'll, I'll pick up uh, where I left off when I come back. And so you take over your dad's job for the two weeks that you're supposed to be there. And so you just drive around in the post uh, office truck and you have every day you have a certain amount of deliveries that you need to make. So it says, all right, I need to deliver this package to this house across the street. OK, and now that I've delivered that, I need to deliver this package to across the lake. And you just do that throughout the day. And that's how you progress through the game. Just unbelievably interesting and cool a very relaxing game as well it took me uh, two sittings to get through I thought I was going to finish it on a new year's day but I didn't for whatever reason so I finished it the next day and it just was a little bit longer because when you get to the near the end game your days of driving around the lake, dropping off packages, uh, your packages increase and the uh, places that you need to go increase as well. And so you kind of have to plot a map of which package am I going to drop off where? Because if you don't, if you drop off the package, you drive all the way across the lake, which takes, you know, three or four minutes or whatever, and then you drop it off, and then you come back and drop it off another package across the street from the post office, and then you realize, oh, there's this package that I need to drive across the lake as well. If you don't plan out your route uh, very well, it's going to take a lot longer. And I think I did that maybe once or twice, but I really enjoyed the game overall. I thought it was really interesting how they tied all the storylines together and allow you to make a decision in the game to whether you want to stay in that lake community and live in your old house that you grew up in and kind of repick up your life and start new and fresh, but with your old house and your old friends, rekindling friendships, or if you just want to split and say, you know what, I found this person, uh, but, you know, I, I, I have this love interest, but, you know, I have my own life and I'm a programmer in the city and I want to go there too. So there is some end game scenarios that you can change up the way that you uh, finish the game and the story. And I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, very fun little game. Uh, there also is some stuff in there that they kind of shoehorn in some political agenda stuff which I did not like and I I, I revolt against that stuff at this point and yeah I hate that stuff they try and push it but you can push back and I thought that was actually really interesting where you go no whoa whoa wait a minute I don't know what you think was going on here but that's not how I swing and you can push back uh, and I thought that was actually at least good that they allow you to do that so that you're not shoehorned into this, you know, crap that I don't want to take part in. So I played Lake. 
And then I moved on to Mortal Kombat 11. I am not a good fighting game person. I suck at fighting games. I'm a button masher, plain and simple. Um, I don't like the way that fighting games have moved towards fighting game communities, which I hate when people say acronyms, but they don't say what the acronyms stand for. So if you don't know, if you're not in the know of what an acronym stands for already, you are lost. And I think gaming has a real bad tendency for saying acronyms or, or different types of things without specifying what the heck they're talking about. So a lot of people will use the acronym uh, FGC, and it stands for Fighting Game Community. And fighting games have drifted towards this way of making games specifically for their crowd, the fighting game community. And I don't like that because it inhibits people who are not in that community, who have no idea who people like Daigo are and things like that, and they don't care and they don't want to know. And if you don't know, you are lost and you basically can't play their games. And I don't like that. So Mortal Kombat has been a staple in the gaming community since 90, what, 93, 92, somewhere around there. Uh, I remember renting the Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis and, oh man, I fell in love with that game, but I was really bad at it. Those games are very, very difficult if you don't memorize the moves sets and you don't memorize the finishers and stuff like that. You know, that's what that stuff is all about, which I totally get. You want to be good at the game. You need to know how to play it. And because fighting games are so different than normal you know, single player action adventure type games. If you don't memorize the moveset, you're basically just button mashing and you're not really playing the game the way it's intended. So I totally understand that. It's just, I cannot do that on my own. I have a really hard time with that. So when I played through Mortal Kombat 11, I wanted to do so because I heard the story was actually pretty interesting. They, they do, uh, <clears throat> what they've been doing with the modern Mortal Kombat, starting with Mortal Kombat 9 on the 360 and PS3 back in 2009, they revitalized by basically saying, we're going to retell the original game's stories in modern context. And they got this continuity set up, which I thought was really interesting. And with 11, they went with a um, uh, uh, time, wow, Time machine, uh, uh, time travel. Thank you, <laughs> man. Blinking out there for a second. But they go with this time travel mechanic in the story, which basically allows them to use the modern versions of people like Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade and Scorpion and all that. And they also go and allow themselves to play around with the original 90s versions of the characters. So you see Johnny Cage being a super jerky, cocky, you know, Hollywood star. And then uh, as his 90s character interacting with his more mature, modernized version of his, himself. And he even comments, man, I was a jerk, you know, and stuff like that. And I thought that was a really interesting way to go. They, they bring it all together in a very satisfying way. Uh, there is DLC that also allows to kind of progress the story past where they uh, got with the base game. And unfortunately, I played it on Game Pass. And Game Pass does not have the DLC for free. I would have to pay for it. And I didn't want to pay for DLC on a game that I didn't own. So I didn't play the DLC, so I don't really know where the story is at this exact moment. But I played through the base game of DLC or the base game of Mortal Kombat 11. I really, really enjoyed it, even though I did button mash my way through the story mode. Uh, it was a little bit difficult in uh, certain areas too, which those games already are. But um, I really, really enjoyed that game for what it is. Even though I'm not a big fighting game person, I enjoy stories and games. Uh, if they're told well. And I think Mortal Kombat 11 does a really good job of doing that. Then I went through my skate phase last year. 
with our Discord server, we we're having a conversation about um, Skate 2. A couple guys in the server were talking about Skate 2, and I went, man, I really didn't play through Skate 2. I remember Skate 3 because I played through Skate... Uh, I played through a good chunk of Skate 3 when I was living in Colorado, and that's really all that I remember of the series. No, no, no. I played through Skate... Part of Skate 2, but I never finished it. That's what it was. And then when uh, Skate 3 came out, I actually owned the video game store at that point in my life. So I had a bunch of my friends come in and play it. And I remember Coach Frank, uh, Jason Lee's character, Coach Frank. And I remember him. And that's basically it. And I picked up Skate 3 after they were talking about Skate 2. And I played like 30 seconds of the game. And I went, I have no idea how where I am in this story mode. I don't know what to do. So I got to just kind of replay uh, from the beginning. And so I was going to do that. But then they were talking about Skate 2. And I was like, you know what? Why don't we have a Game of the Month series? And this is the start of our Game of the Month series where we all picked and voted on a game to play throughout and talk about throughout the month that allowed us to kind of... Um, keep the conversation going so that more people could be involved in stuff like that. And for me, because everyone was talking about Skate 2, that was what we picked. But I didn't want to just play Skate 2. I wanted to go back from the beginning because that's how I am. If I'm going to play a franchise, I'm going to start from the beginning and move my way through the series. I'm not going to just pick up, you know, if... Uh, people were talking about Hitman 3. I wouldn't just pick up and p start playing Hitman 3. I would play Hitman 1, then 2, then 3. So that's what I did. I played through Skate 1, then Skate 2, and then Skate 3. And I really enjoyed the series. Uh, it blows my mind that Black Box doesn't exist anymore. And it blows my mind that EA just has completely wiped that series off the face of the earth. Um it's really, really unfortunate because it's a very special type of game. I love Tony Hawk, and I think those games are phenomenal, but I also think there is a place for different types of games as well uh, in the skateboarding genre of video games. And Skate fills that hole completely. And with Skate 3 uh, into the bailing out mechanics, uh, oh my gosh, I just had so much fun making my character just break i loaded up skate 3 not more than three days ago uh after the the new year i was sitting there i was testing out my xbox one x um streaming capability on the network and i just i said oh you know let me load up uh, my xbox one on my pc and so i was streaming and I, I was like, well, I got to play something. And Skate 3 was right there because that's the last game I played on it. So I popped it in. I loaded into the world. And I have um, where my character is loaded is like this perfect section where you can do this grind. But it's on a upper level. And if you fall, you drop down into the skate park area. Uh, but it's like a 30-foot fall. And like your character would die if he fell. <laughs> so... I, I have that loaded up and I, I just bailed out a few times and I just giggled to myself and my wife looked over and was like, oh, you're playing that game again. You know, it's it's a really enjoyable game series and I I love it. I had such a good time with that series and I'm really happy that was our first game of the year. So I played through Skate 1, then I played through Skate 2, then 3. And then on Game Pass, they released Taiko the Drum Master, which is like this rhythm game, but it's a Japanese rhythm game. And basically, you instead of like playing guitar like or, or um, guitar or bass or singing like in rock band, you just play drums. But there's no peripheral, peripheral for it. It is just using the controller. And so I played through that on the Switch a couple years ago when we were in the midst of moving in 2020. Um, and I just went, man, I'm just playing something because I want to play something. I had to sit in the car while people were um, checking out our open house and stuff like that. And I just was like, oh, this kind of sucks. But I sat there and I waited and uh, played through that yeah, played through that game on Switch. But then I played through it on Game Pass on PC. And it's the same exact experience. It took me, you know, a single sitting to play through like 40 songs or whatever, maybe two sittings. But 
I finished it up. It's not good. I really don't like it. It's, no, it was one sitting because the songs are not full songs either. They're parts of songs in certain aspects and certain songs. And you're just button pressing, you know, to the rhythm, which is fun when it's songs that you know and enjoy. But the majority of the songs are Japanese and they're vocaloids. So you're getting like the uh, Hatsune Miku and, and stuff like that. A lot of Japanese anime theme songs and crap. And I, I just hate that stuff. I hate it with a passion. So I did not like it. And I was pissed off about it. And I kind of hate played through it. And I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to play through a game that I hate. I want to stop playing games that I hate or dis are disinterested in. And I'll talk about that in near the end of this section. So the next game for February, um, I played through A Plague Tale Innocence because that was our game of the year for February. And man, I am so happy I played through this game. It came out a couple years ago. I was interested in it, but it was uh, too expensive when it came out for what I thought it was going to be. And then it became, it was on Game Pass and I played through it and I think it's just a phenomenal game. Uh, the story is, uh, takes place in like the 14th century. You're this brother and sister combo where you have to escape, you know, people who are chasing you, trying to kill you. And there is a plague of rats throughout the entire game that, you know, follow you and all this stuff. And it's just this wave of rats that infest the city, destroy everything, and kill you. And you have to, um, basically, it's a little bit of stealth, a little bit of um, action, uh, melee combat, you know, uh, ranged combat, and just traversing through this world and the story is just, it's unbelievable because it's so gory and gross. It's just dripping, and I mean just dripping with this atmosphere of dread and uh, gore and violence and disgustingness. And it was really cool because I played through that game. I loved it. I raved about it. And then they announced that the sequel was coming out in 2022. And so I just was over the moon excited about playing through that game this uh, last year. And then the sequel came coming out in the same year as well. I love when that happens. Unfortunately, it did get delayed um, a couple months, so it, did, it didn't come out until the end of the year, and I'll talk about that uh, at the very end here. So I played through a, tale, uh, a Plague Tale Innocence, and then I played through a little game called Infernax, which I thought was so interesting. With indie games, there is this over-reliance on what people call Metroidvania, and I'm, I'm making kind of a stand at this point where I'm not going to use a lot of terms that I don't agree with. So I'm not going to say that type of genre style anymore. It is not really even that because it's so taking from Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, more than anything. It literally is basically Simon's Quest mechanics. And with an uh, updated coat of paint and not Castlevania. Uh, so it's a different story. But basically, it is Simon's Quest to modernized. You have a day night cycle, and it actually goes and basically does their own version of, oh, what a terrible night to have a curse and all that. But it's such a fun uh, side scrolling platformer game that has towns in it where you can do side quests. Uh, it has branching paths as well, so you can make a decision, and that decision will come up later on, uh, and, and there's consequences for your decisions. Um, there was one where I played this part where I chose to kill someone, and that came up later on in the town where I actually actually killed the person who was the husband of this wife character and she has a shop and she knows I killed her husband so she won't let me shop at her store anymore and I thought that was really really interesting so there's consequences to my actions which I thought were fantastic then I played through aperture desk job which is like a maybe half hour 
uh, experience. It's barely a job, or it's <laughs> it's barely a game. But Valve released this game, quote unquote, to uh, showcase their new Steam Deck. S- yeah, Steam Deck, handheld portable Switch version. Basically, it's it's the Switch, uh, but it's a portable PC. And I want to get one. I actually had a reservation because they were really hard to get uh, in the beginning. But uh, coming up with an excuse to spend $600 on a portable PC, uh, I made the better decision to not get one. And I really want one, but at the same time, I know that the majority of the time it would sit and collect dust. I would only use it in the very rare case. And like with most Steam products... It's just going to collect dust. I, I, their hardware is good, but they really don't um, do a good job of upkeeping their their products. Even though I own you know, Steam Link, I own several Steam controllers, I own a Steam Index, which is the VR headset. Uh, I, I own all of their products, but at some point it's like, dude, I just don't use this stuff. It is They come up with this stuff, and it's just not well supported. Everyone is raving about the Steam Deck. I think it's going to actually do very, very well for them. But at the same time, it's just, I'm not going to use it. So I didn't buy it. But they released this Aperture Desk job to showcase the Steam Deck. And they released it on Steam. And so I was able to play it even without a Steam Deck, even though it features some gyro controls that you're supposed to use and stuff like that. But You can still play it on normal PC without a Steam Deck, and I did. And it's really cool because they continue on with Aperture Science Labs from Portal and Cave Johnson, the character, and you find out what what goes on with him and stuff. And it's like, man, Valve just, they, they suck. And the reason they suck is because they send their stuff out to die. They don't treat their products or their their IPs, their games, whatever you want to call them, with enough respect. This is a free-to-play 20, 30-minute, you know, uh, maybe two hours. I can't, I honestly don't remember. It has such a little impact on me. I have no idea how long it takes. But, oh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> it's 30 minutes because I have my note right here. Uh, but it's a 30 minute more experience like there's very little gameplay to it and it's very basic you're just stationary it's a shooting gallery Um, but the story that they tell in it is so good for that 30 minute experience it's like dude don't give me some flat out lie of oh we don't know what to do with half-life 3 Um, no you know exactly we don't know what to do with a portal 3 you know exactly what to do you just are lazy and don't want to do it. There is no excuse for them not producing these games. They would make a million billion dollars. You know, everyone would buy a new Valve game. Everyone bought Half-Life Alex, and it was a VR exclusive game. Anyone who has VR basically has Half-Life Alex. Uh, if you have a headset that you can use with it. So if you have a Quest 2, if you have um, a PC vr headset you own half-life alex because it's one of the best half-life or it's one of the best half-life games period and it's also one of the best vr games as well so anyone who has pc vr uh basically plays and owns it if they opened up and said we're making pc exclusive half-life 3 or whatever portal 3 or whatever people would buy it so there's no excuse of it won't make money and the excuse of we, we are we, there's an expectation of us being you know um, so innovative because Half Life One was innovative, Half Life Two was groundbreaking. So there's this expectation of three. I think that is one of the stupidest things that you can say as a business. Of there's expectation, and since we don't know how to meet that expectation, we're not even going to try. I I think that's dumb. That is a dumb, stupid thing. But they make billions of dollars every year because of Steam and their storefront. They don't have to try anymore. And Valve is not in the business of making games. They put out these quote-unquote games that are more experiences than anything else. 
And that is what pisses me off because I do really like Valve as a company. I think they're run terribly, though. I think they're a st- they're run in a very bad manner. The whole open-ended, do whatever you want. They have hundreds of employees that have been working on projects for years and years and years, and then they cancel it for no apparent reason. No one sees it; doesn't see the light of day. And it's like you could work at Valve for ten years and not have anything to show for it, other than you made a lot of money doing nothing. And it's just, it's a shame. It's its almost like, it feels like a scam uh, where these people make these things. It's like, you can have a, de- you should have a dedicated team for Steam and the store and, you know, all that stuff. And Steam doesn't even do anything. They have an update once every several years. And it's like, of course, you got to go through a lot of, you know, testing because Steam is such a big component of PC gaming. But at the same time, man, it's just, oh, it's such a bummer. And I didn't mean to go on a ramp there, but it bums me out because when I played Aperture Desk Job, that continues the Portal story, and it basically finalizes it. It's Portal 3 in a nutshell, and it finalizes a couple characters in that game that is a throwaway free experience that most people don't even know exist. It's like, dude, what are you doing? There's so much potential here. Ugh, it bums me out. And then we get to the big one, Elden Ring. I talked about this on previous podcasts, and I'm not going to go too in-depth into it, but I hate Dark Souls with a passion. I hate From Software, but Elden Ring is a good game. It's a phenomenal game. It was easily the best game of last year with a hard, hard bullet. Um, I devoured this game and I did not think I was going to. I played through the entire game in about 90 hours over the 95 hours over the course of, of a month. And boy, that was, it, it was exhausting uh, I really, really think the ending should have ended when you burned the Erd tree. I don't think that it uh, should have gone any further than that because it definitely soured me on that. But I'll talk a little bit more about it at the uh, second part of this podcast because I don't want to get too much into it now. <clears throat> then I played a game called Shredders, which was a uh, weird indie game that was on Game Pass It's got a lot of heart, but it is um, a very bad, technically bad game. Um, I love snowboarding games. 1080 snowboarding, SSX series. I love snowboarding games. And this came out, you know, in the wintertime. It was in March, uh, which is, you know, straddling uh, spring. But there was still cold weather, and playing a snowboarding game in cold weather is just Uh, I love it. So I I played through that game and it was really fantastic. Very short game. Teardown was the next game that I played in April. And this was in early access, but it is such a weird experience because it's all voxelized gameplay. And voxels are basically, instead of polygons glued together to create character models and stuff like that in the world, Everything is made out of tiny little cubes. You can kind of think about it like Minecraft in a way, where everything is made out of tiny little cubes, and every cube has physics applied to it. So when I walk up to a building and I have a sledgehammer and I start taking chunks out of that building, the wall is going to crumble and break with the physics applied to it in a really unique and interesting way. And if I walk around the entire building and I take out all four walls, all four corners, the building is going to fall and crumble. And it's just, it was such a interesting design choice with the physics that it made playing the game really, really interesting. However, the storyline, the actual game mechanic of how you beat levels and progress through the story is um, disappointing, to say the least. It's basically heists, where every level is a heist, where you have to complete uh, the level objective in one minute. 
So you spend as long as you want walking around each level, planning everything out, taking out specific walls and corners, and then you have to grab the item that you're going to steal and get out with it within 60 seconds. Every level is basically like that. There's just a few at the tail end of the game that are not like that, but I'd say about 95%, yeah, 90% of the game is basically that. And it was just like, man, the, the idea of this game is so solid, but the fact that they spent so much time and, and the heart of the game is a heist and your character sucks. Uh, the character that you play is not sympathetic at all. They don't really speak or anything. You just get emails and you basically get blackmailed into doing a bunch of stuff for a bunch of people. And I just thought the story, like it started out interesting uh, where you are just a demolition guy. Y your family, you own a family business. You work with your mom and you do all these demolition stuff, uh, this company. And then you just become this crook and this criminal and you blackmail everyone and everyone's blackmailing you. And it's like, wow, that I don't want to play as this character. This character sucks. I, I'm on the side of the cop that I'm uh, blackmailing or is blackmailing me or whatever, you know, it's just the story and the the basic heart of the game was not as good as it could have been. But it's still a fun game. Then uh, I played Cyberpunk in May. Cyberpunk 2077. I bought the game day one when it released. And uh, <laughs> I bought it and it, it released the day before we uh, drove out to uh, Tennessee to find houses. And so I did not have that time to actually put into it. And by the time I had the time to play it, I didn't I didn't I didn't have the time to play it and then when I finally did it was like almost half a year later and there was so many issues with that game uh, but I waited and I waited and waited and they came out with this <clears throat> this new update that fixed so many things about the game that it was basically like the version to play and so I played that and they also there was a VR mod for it too. So I played a little bit of it in VR and I thought it was fantastic. Although it did not perform very well in certain aspects, but I love Cyberpunk. I think it's a really really good game. I think the side quests are just phenomenal in that game. And oh my gosh, I could not believe how great that uh game was from the beginning I picked it up. Uh, this year, which I continued my story. I actually debated on whether I should start from scratch because I was like five, six hours into that game maybe. And I didn't want to replay the first five or six hours of that game. So I opted for just picking up, starting from where I left off. And I just plowed through that game. I loved it. I put in, let's see, about almost 50 hours into that game, 47.5 hours phenomenal game i i enjoy it if you hear people talk bad about that game it's because they didn't play it and they're just parroting um online articles about how the performance sucks like they're stupid that game is really good it did a lot to damage uh not just everyone's uh faith in cd project red but even my own you know i th i think they they mishandled that whole game terribly i think there was a lot of stuff that could have been done better should have been done better still needs to be done better but it's still a good game at its core then i played through sniper elite 5 oh i loved this game kind of the mechanics of the game the gameplay itself are fantastic the gigantic open world levels that you have to play around with in uh, sneak and, and snipe everything is just so pitch perfect in this game but the story and the character suck the character that you play as carl which is the main uh protagonist from the entire series is just basically could be a wet piece of cardboard like he is so generic so uninteresting has nothing interesting about him other than he is an american who is german so he can speak German, he looks German, so when he infiltrates, you know, a German headquarters, he can pass off as German, uh, like a soldier. But that's about it. 
everything else is is just a blank slate. Who cares? He has no personality whatsoever. And the story is so bare bones. Oh, the Germans have another secret weapon. Like, this is the fifth game in the series, and it's the same story every single time, which is just, it's boring. Uh, I don't remember the uh, antagonist. Uh, they have another Kill Hitler, which is another, you know, lookalike, I believe, or is. I can't remember. It's so just basic. But the game itself, it was on Game Pass, another Game Pass game, so I didn't spend any money on it, and I definitely got my money's worth out of it uh, far beyond because, man, I, I really enjoyed the gameplay experience. But they also uh, implemented multiplayer in this where it's like... um. Uh, being invaded, which I just abhor. I hate that type of style of gameplay. Again, Dark Souls has just infested the gaming world so much uh, with good and bad things. I think more bad than good. But I thought Sniper uh, Elite 5 was totally worth playing. Uh, if you like slow, methodical planning out, but also action adventure, there was so many times where I shot someone, someone heard it, and I had to go hide. People were looking for me, and I just made a whole mess of the situation, but I still got out of there by the skin of my teeth. Fantastic game. Then I played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Shredder's Revenge, the revitalization of the classic couch co-op Ninja Turtles experience. They use the art style. Basically, it's pixelized versions. It's pixel art, but the art style of the classic cartoon, uh, the 80s cartoon, along with all the original voice cast members that are still alive. Shredder, who was played by um, Fresh Prince's Uncle Phil, uh, is uh, passed away, so he did not reprise the role, but I think they got a good sound alike for Shredder. But everyone else is there. All the turtles are there. Uh, it's the style, art style of the cartoon. So it's basically a cartoon, a playable cartoon uh, version. And it's it was really, really fun. However, my major, 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 major issue with this is that it is shallow. It is a single sitting experience. You, they have collectibles in the world. In each level that you can, or not each level, but most levels they have collectibles that you can find. But because it's a side scroller, there's no beaten, there's no off the beaten path experience. You cannot go find that stuff, go exploring, and those collectibles don't do anything either. This has, I think it's up to six, uh, I think it's six playable character or uh, six playable characters, four player co op. And so you can play all four turtles at, at once. And, and what I did is I got online with my buddies and we played through the game online, which hasn't happened in years, if ever. I don't remember the last time I played with my friends, uh, my best friends online like that. And it was just, it was a joy. Um, we all loved it. I think the gameplay is really fun. I think the special moves are cool. The character animations are rad. The the levels and the design of the levels and everything are great. It's just a very shallow experience. The collectibles don't do anything. The world map really doesn't do anything other than it's a world map. It's like Scott Pilgrim where they have this like world map, but there's nothing doing it other than you look at it and go, yep, that's cool. And then you move on. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of, again, wasted potential there, but the game was a budget title. And it's a licensed game, so there is expectations there for it being exactly what it is. And it just doesn't go beyond that, which I was really hoping there would be. And there just wasn't. But man, for two and a half hours that I played of it, it was a phenomenal experience, especially with friends. Then I played through a game that I've wanted to play through for years and only after 2020 that I, I got the series. Uh, I played Snow Runner in 2020 and I fell in love with it. I just, I, I want to play it right now. As I'm speaking about it, I want to sit down and play more Snow Runner. I think it's so interesting of a game. But 
we picked Mud Runner as that game at that month's game of the month. And uh man, what a fun game it was, but it's very bare bones compared to Snow Runner. Going back to the previous game in the series and going, oh, there's barely anything. Like it's the same exact mission throughout the entire game. You play mission one, you've played mission 30. It's pick this thing up, take it from here to here, and that's it. And there's a lot of that in SnowRunner too, but SnowRunner does a lot more where you have to not just traverse the environment, but you have to build extra paths. You have to to, uh, pick up, you know, different types of uh, material that have fallen off uh, off a cliff or edge side. You have to um, tow cars and stuff like that. That's all SnowRunner. MudRunner, you haul a trailer from here to here, point A to point B. That's it. Uh, But there's a lot of really interesting level design choices in that where, like, you clearly are not supposed to go this way, but you can, and it's way quicker and faster if you don't flip your car over and get it stalled. Uncovering the map and exploring is seriously the best part about that game, and it's just a joy. I really, really loved it. Then Cuphead DLC finally got released, and I played through that. Man, what a phenomenal game. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe how good Cuphead is. I'll talk about uh, it more, but man, that DLC is just fantastic. Then after I finished Cuphead, I needed something a little bit quick, so I played Gunman Clive 2. Gunman Clive is like this very interesting, broad stroke, very simple platformer shooter um, in the style of Mega Man that is all hand drawn. And it's a Western themed game. So it's like right up my alley. And it originally got released on the DS or I believe 3DS. And I remember buying it and going, oh, this is interesting. But I never finished the second one. I bought the second one, but I never played through and finished it. I, I played through the first level and then didn't pick it up ever again. And so I sat down. I played it about, an, it took me about an hour and a half to finish. And I loved every moment of it. It's a great Mega Man style light type of game where there's not a ton of enemies on screen. The screen is actually fairly small. Your character is gigantic compared to what you think like Mega Man is and stuff like that. And it's just, it's a very small personal experience that is created by one person. And I think that that dude deserves everything uh, uh, good said about these games because they're really cool little, like this is what I envision if I could create games. These are the games that I would create. Small scoped games, but very well made. I love it. Uh, Then I played the entire series of Hidden by My Game, Hidden My Game by Mom, which is like this Japanese leaning way too much into the Japanese type of uh, quirkiness that I think a lot of people found endearing with Katamari Damacy. But there is a lot now where they, they, a lot of game designers go oh yeah we'll we'll do that and they just they make it terrible and I'm, I'm just mad about it because it's it's not it's not real it's totally fake and you know it's it's just there's something about it but I I think the game itself is actually pretty interesting it's a little phone game I put, sat through and played through that while we were waiting for mechanics <laughs> um, and while I was in a hotel room and stuff like that so then I played the Hot Wheels DLC for uh, for yeah, Forza Horizon 5, which I love Hot Wheels. I love the fact that they take the Horizon series and make it goofy and unbelievable. You get transported up into the sky in a sky um, island, and there's these big orange and blue you know, Hot Wheels tracks. The one thing that I thought was really, really cool that I really hope, wish and hoped that they leaned into more was there's this one character, this voiceover girl character that basically is like this Hot Wheels fanatic. And there's these missions where you play these 
uh, very special versions of these Hot Wheel cars that you drive around in, these real life sized Hot Wheels cars. And she talks about Hot Wheels like it is the greatest thing in the entire world. The enthusiasm that the way she talks about Hot Wheels in the history, they're like little mini history lessons. Like you start out with like this basic hot rod car and you just drive from point A to point B and she is telling you the history of how Hot Wheels got started. Oh, you know, John Wheel you know, created um, Hot Wheels in his basement as a, um, as a toy for his kids to play, but then he started getting into model making and blo like she just is exhuming so much uh, oh man, Her, the way she is so happy and so joyful about talking about the history of Hot Wheels while you're driving around in these life-size versions of these cars is just the best part of that entire DLC. The DLC itself, not that great. I The way that I approach the uh, Forza games, I do the missions and I want to drive the entire world. So every road, it tells you if you've driven on it or not. And so like there's the uh, the map that kind of highlights if you've driven on it and you've driven that road before and stuff. And so I uncover all the areas that I could drive on. And I really, really enjoyed it, but I thought there was... <sighs> it wasn't worth the amount of money that I paid. I think it was 20 bucks. And I got maybe, if it was 10, drop in the hat, piece of cake, easy. 15 would have been the the limit of it but I think over I think 20 25 bucks I can't remember exactly how much it cost but just didn't seem to do it for me in the way that I hoped it would like I enjoyed it but again it could have been better then I played this fan game which I'm not a big fan of fan games uh, especially Sonic fan games but this was called Sonic Triple Trouble HD and basically what this is, is a HD remake of Sonic Triple Trouble, which is a Game Gear exclusive game, and it's playable on the PC, and it fleshes out the entire game, gives a story to it, and basically makes it a full-on Sonic game. And I love Sonic. You know, I love Sonic games. I don't care who knows it, but they got to be really well done. Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Knuckles... Uh, Sonic CD, which I don't think Sonic CD is that great, to be honest. Uh, what else? I like this first Sonic Adventure. Um, I haven't gone back to it in years, but I think Sonic Adventure 1 is actually a pretty good game. And then Sonic Mania, which was unbelievably good. Like, man, Sonic Mania. I want Sonic Mania 2 right now because I think it would do extremely well sonic mania has the reputation of being the best of the best and i think they could do more with it and i think uh this sonic triple trouble kind of was like filling in that gap of not having sonic mania 2 or not having played a sonic game since 26 2017 so i really wanted to play that then i played kirby in the forgotten wild uh, I thought this game was pretty bad. I like Kirby, but I don't like Kirby games after the Super Nintendo because they're all the exact same. They feature the same characters, the same uh, bosses, the same everything, uh, the same gameplay style. And this is the exact same gameplay style, but with a little bit more open. It's not an open world for sure but it is a little bit larger than the side-scrolling worlds that Kirby is, has always been confined to. So Kirby and the Forgotten Wild is pretty interesting, but definitely not what I thought it was going to be. I played it, I started playing it and going, oh, cool, this looks great, it sounds great, it feels good to play, like controlling Kirby and, and getting the different power-ups. But once you realize, oh, it's the same exact game with a new coat of paint, it's not enough anymore. Nintendo really needs to stop making the same exact games. Kirby is in the same, same experience that in the same formula that uh, 
Zelda was in for so long. Zelda had that 3D formula where it was the same exact game every single time with a different story applied to it. And it got really, really boring. How terrible is Skyward Sword? How terrible it was Twilight Princess? How terrible was Majora's Mask? All of those games follow the same exact formula as uh, Ocarina of Time. And none of them are as good because they're just the same. Oh, Wind Waker as well. It's all the same exact game. Wind Waker is a little bit different. It's a lot more open uh, world. Um, I still need to finish Wind Waker HD some, someday. <laughs> but uh, I really did not have a good time with Kirby and the Forgotten Wild like I thought I was going to. Then I played through the original Sonic the Hedgehog because I did want to play more Sonic games, and I was actually going to do a whole Sonic uh, playthrough. I just didn't have the time. Um, I got really sick at that point, um, and then I also was traveling a lot too, so I just didn't have the time to put into it. I also played Lonely Downhill Mountains, which was a game that I picked up a couple years ago. It's on Game Pass, and it's like this weird semi it's deceptive in its art style because its art style is very low polygon, very limited um, artistic style. But the gameplay is basically speed running where you have to get through, get down the mountain, start at the top, you get down the bottom. You're just biking, you're, you're mountain biking. And <coughs> excuse me, there's these checkpoints that you have to progress through. And it's just like, wow, I thought this was going to be a peaceful, you know, easy breezy game. And it gets really tough. One of my favorite things about this year is that while playing this game, I found a new band to get into. And I want to talk about this for just a quick second because I think it's, ah, uh, I love it. So I have been a huge, huge fan of the band Coheed and Cambria ever since uh, around 2008. Uh, it, the song Welcome Home was in rock band and it just, it, it was labeled as an emo song, uh, which I'm not into the genre of emo. And when I played it, the singer's voice was so high in rock band that I, I just did not want to play that game or that, that song in that game ever. But my friend really, really pushed me into, no, you got to listen to them more. You got to listen to them more. They're really good. And man, I fell in love with that band. Their new album came out that same year that I got into them. So they had a new album and it was not the best, but I've grown to really, really enjoy it. And then a couple of years later, I dropped another album, another, another, another. And over the course of over a decade, you know, about 12 years or so, I've been more than 12, 14 years, I guess. Wow. Time has flown, flown by. But about 14 years, I've really, really gotten into them. And I love their music. And then they started releasing the last several albums, which I have hated uh, with a passion. I think they're terrible albums. Uh, their their style is completely changed to the it's it's very pop, uh, and very wussy. It's wuss rock, uh, at this point, and it's because I kind of hate saying this. I I kind of hate saying that as well because um, the the lead singer and like the main you know member of the band has uh, grown up, gotten married, had a kid, you know, gone through all lifestyle changes, and the music has suffered from that. He obviously, I don't believe, thinks that, and I don't think a lot of people think that, but I do, and that's that's the way that I I listen to this really hard, very unique sounding style. And just completely gone off the wayside. Uh, all the music now sounds like something that you listen to on the radio. And there's no heart behind it. Or if there is heart, it's so sappy that it's just like, Ugh, I don't care about your kid anymore. Like, I know you do, but boy, three albums about your son. Like, I just don't care. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was kind of a little bit bummed about that. Then, as I was playing Lonely Downhill Mountain to kind of bring this all around, sorry, I didn't mean to get on another tangent there, 
I uh, I was listening to Spotify, and Spotify had this recommendation for this new song, the the weekly refresh or whatever, where they show up with new music. There was this band called Dance Gavin Dance, and they released their new album that day. So it showed up, and as I had it playing in the background while playing Lonely Downhill Mountains, I was like, wow, this is this is a pretty interesting, good song. And I thought it was Coheed and Cambria. I went, oh, did they release a new album? Which they totally did, by the way. And I listened to it and I hate it. But this, this, I thought it was Coheed and Cambria, but I was like, this is totally different because it's not just that, that high pitched singing, quote unquote, emo, whatever you want to call it at this point. I'm not really big into genres of music anymore because it's branched out so far. Um, you can get into, you know, what the difference between black metal and death metal and, uh, you know, black death metal and blah, 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 and all that stuff. I think there's definitely good genres of music and, and there needs to be clear definitions. But when you split it, a sub, 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 sub genre into 18 different versions of sub, 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 sub genres of music, then you're getting way too minute in differences. And it's like, dude, that's come on. So this band dance gavin dance i was like man this is really interesting there's like the the high pitched vocals but there's also the screaming which i'm not a big fan of but there's something to that just visceral like deep seated almost it, it sounds like hatred in a way that i don't think it's probably the best <laughs> way to describe it but almost kind of like there's just this guttural vocal ripping vocal cord quality to uh, what the singer is is sounding like when he's screaming. Or they actually have two different. They have the what, and I learned this uh, just recently, uh, kind of f following this band and uh, learning about them over the course of the last couple of months. They have clean vocals, which is basically the more audible, you know. To, uh, singing like a normal singer does and then dirty vocals which i believe is what it's called where that's the screaming where it is just you can barely understand it it's unintelligible most of the time in the all that type of stuff so they have two different singers and the band sounds very much like a version of coheed and cambria modern coheed and cambria that i want to listen to but they also have the screaming part which i'm not really into but i've grown into liking it and so this Lonely Downhill Mountains really got me into this band, and I've listened to their music more than anything else this last year, um, even though I discovered them late into the year. So I thought that was really cool. Then a little game called Roller Drome came out, and man, oh man, uh, Roller Drome, really cool premise, but it just didn't stick the the landing i hate puns and that's not intentional but it really didn't hold the the premise very well it didn't do a good job of explaining everything and it's probably because it was a very sh small little game compared to uh what they also produced so i played roller drum and then i played ollie ollie world because it's by the same people and I really liked the first Ollie Ollie, which is like a side-scrolling skateboarding game. And it's supposed to be designed as a speed-running game, which I'm not into at all. I just want to play the game. I want to finish the level and move on. I don't want to repeat the same level 400 times to find all the little differences, which is why I didn't like Ollie Ollie World, which I played right after. Um, there's various reasons why I hate Ollie Ollie World. I think it's a terrible game. Don't ever play it. Uh, the characters are terrible. And when I say terrible, I want to actually explain why they're terrible, like most people don't. So these characters are designed to be adults, but they speak like children. They act like children. And it is all in this art style that is very reminiscent of a culture movement that I don't agree with at all. I refuse to give that culture movement the the voice that they try so desperately to seek and i just i hate it i i honestly do i i don't 
like the way that they push this political and social agenda in these games. Um, and you can tell right off bat, the bat because of the uh, color palette that they use and the wording and the flavor text and all this stuff that they put in there is just like, dude, you see through it. It is such a blatant veil that you go, dude, I know exactly what you're doing. And I'm mad that I bought this game. I'm mad that I bought Ollie Ollie World because I hate everything about it other than the actual mechanic of playing the game, which I'm, I'm bummed about. I really enjoyed uh, probably the first several levels and not like a single, you know, five minute level. I'm talking about the worlds, the, the first couple of worlds I really, really enjoyed. Uh, but then it just got so deep into, they want you to spend hundreds of hours in this game. And I wanted to finish it within two. Uh, I thought it uh, two hours, it was, you know, three or four worlds would have been perfect. Um, but it just keeps going on and the characters I did not care about. I wanted them to all die because of the way that they talked and the way that they um, spoke and just the the generalization of that type of person. I'm just like, dude, I hate this person. <laughs> this character, I hate. I want them to fall into acid. <laughs> um, so I just wanted them off screen as quick as possible. So like I just... I, I sped read through the 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 wording, but those you know when games get into visual novel you know territory with their um their dialogue where it's just all flavor text all modernized speak yo dog what's up and it takes forever to read because you could have voice acted this and it would have been easier. Um, I just ugh, I I don't like it so I hated. Uh, Ollie Ollie World, but Roller Drome was really really good, just shorter and and lighter in the story aspects that I, which was what I thought was more compelling than the actual gameplay itself. Then I got a PS5. I finally was able to track down and purchase a PS5 and play what most people put in 2020 as their game of the year, which was Astro's Playroom, which is not a game. All right. It is, I mean, technically it's a game, but it is not a, it's a tech demo. It's a pack-in tech demo, not a full-fledged game. And I don't know why Sony is going so hard into the Astros, or Astro as a, you know, mascot, because it's so ambiguous, because it is so, it's basically like community's human being where it's so inoffensive, it's so void of any sort of personality other than childlike waving in, in gleeful, you know, croning, that they can make it whatever they want. And they do that with this game, where the entire worlds that they build in these little levels to uh, showcase... Everyone said... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> everyone said this game was a showcase for the PS5, which is untrue to its core. It's a showcase for the PS5 controller. The, what is it called? Dual Sense 5. That game exists solely so that you understand how the controller works. That's it. It has nothing to do with the showcase of the PS5. Um, I think the PS5 is fine. It's a console, which I don't care about. I only bought it because I wanted to play the games that were only going to be on Sony platforms uh, or the PS5 platform. I bought it so that I could play Horizon Forbidden West, God of War Ragnarok, whatever next Uncharted game that they make, and whatever other Sony exclusive games that they make. Uh, the Oh, The Last of Us, you know, whatever parts that they're going to play to do next. That's why I bought a PS5. I was curious about the controller. I actually bought the controller on launch day, and then I it shipped to my house, and I didn't open the package, and I refunded it because I said, what am I doing? I don't even live in a house right now. I don't own a PS5. I, I was assuming I was going to buy one, and I wanted a second uh, controller, uh, but I couldn't get a hold of a PS5, but I could get a hold of a PS5 controller, uh, which was a bummer. So... I returned it, and I wanted to play around with the controller, so when I got the PS5, I was excited about it. But it is just a piece of machinery. It's the ugliest uh, piece of machinery I've ever laid my eyes on. I, I think the PS5 itself is 
just a it, it could have been a black cardboard box or just a cardboard box sitting on a shelf and it would have been fine i'd rather have it stuck in the um shipping box that it came in rather than whatever ugly design that that system actually has in its foreign plastic but that's neither here nor there because i played astro's playroom which is a tech demo and it's fine um the character basically is so like i was saying so ambiguous so uh, void of any type of personality that the entire worlds that they create in this tech demo uh, they showcase all the characters all the sony characters so you see like aloy from horizon zero dawn you know climbing up astrobot the character because it's just a machine it's a robot so they have hundreds of them throughout the level that it's uh, uh dressed up as aloy uh, in one area. And then another corner, you know, on a ledge, they have, you know, um, a Nathan Drake from Uncharted version of the character hanging off the side of a ledge, you know, in an airplane. And then they, in another corner, they have um, one of the Astrobots uh, dressed up as Jill Valentine from Resident Evil and stuff like that. And it's just like, oh, this this character has no personality of its own. So they they dress it up in its uh the other sony mascots and stuff like that and other sony characters so you can kind of see like hey you know whatever um it's it's a really interesting like showpiece as a museum it should i think the astros playroom should be the ui and dashboard for the system instead of what they have and having it a game that that would have been so much more interesting you boot it up it loads right up into the the area where you can unlock all the different playstation models and in peripherals and all that stuff and then you can walk over to the gaming corner and then that's where you boot up all your game. like that's such a more interesting idea than what they went through with which is just a another version of uh playstation 4 with a, a much more weird layout oh man that's what they should have done <laughs> astro's playroom is a tech demo period uh then i played destroy all humans 2 reprobed i play this is a remake of the second destroy all humans game and i played destroy all humans 1 remake last year and i really enjoyed it because i never finished that game and I loved it, but the second one, I hate this phrase, but they double down. They they go deeper and harder into this really, really forced comedic style of, of parody where you play in, the, uh, in London in swinging 1969, and uh, there is a lot of Austin Powers references and all that stuff. It is a solid remake for the fact that they don't change anything. And they actually say up front, we made this game and we did not alter the story or the lines of dialogue because it's you know it's a remake we're not we're not changing anything we're just giving it a better coat of paint more technical so that you can play this on modern consoles and i thought that was awesome <coughs> but the writing is really really terrible it's just it's again it's all forced parodies it's this it's the video game equivalent of those really bad scary movie knockoffs where they had like epic movie and disaster movie and all the you know uh, Van Wilder ripoffs or spinoffs and American Pie, you know, sequels and all that stuff. It's that force type of just like, oh, you gave this an initial thought. You came up with the joke in the writer's room. You wrote it down and it went into the game without, you know, workshopping it at all, without refining it at all. Then I played through Metal Hellsinger which is a rhythm-based shooter game. And the idea is solid. I'm really bad at it because of rhythm. I'm bad at rhythm. I've never been able to hold a beat <laughs> or uh, clap on command or time. So I just had a really, really hard time with this game. Even, in, even dropping it down to easy was not the way that I wanted to play the game uh, because it layers the... Um, the music as you play through so you start off 
the level with the underlying drum bass track, and that's it. And then, <clears throat> like, like the underlying beat track. And then as you progress through the level, which is all corridor shooters and, and stuff like that, it's a very... Uh, I hate using the word basic a, a lot, but I, I tend to because that's how I feel a lot about a lot of these games. It's, it's a corridor shooter. There's not really a whole lot to it. it you just... Designers want you to shoot on beat. And I had a really hard time with that. So as you shoot characters and you rack up combos, the combos will layer on the different musical tracks. So you start out with just the 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 beat track, the underlying beat track that allows you to shoot on beat. And then when you build up a, a, the first combo, then it layers the drum track. And then you build up the combo even more. Then it layers the rhythm bass track. Then you layer on more. Then it layers on the um, uh, the the lead guitar track. And then you you build up the combo to maximum. And then it layers on the vocal track. And each level has a uh, created for the game song. And each level is uh, featuring a different vocal performer or musician from a famous metal band. And the big one, the one that they touted was Serge from uh, System of a Down. And he's the last level uh, final boss <laughs> um, musical track. And I thought it was awesome. I thought I thought the music was really, really good. I thought the, the music... Um, trying to think of the word here. But it pairs well with the gameplay itself. It's phenomenal it's really cool is just i wish that they had a mode for i suck at rhythm games i cannot perform this uh please let me play it like a normal shooter with a full audio track going the entire time or 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 designed in a way so that it brings in the vocals at at the point where it needs to it ducks them down when the uh when the action is is low or non-existent. I thought that would be a perfect way to make the game playable for everyone instead of those who can keep a beat. And I know I'm I'm in the majority or minority of that uh, group, but that's how I feel. Then I played the Puppeteer, which I've always wanted to play. This was a PS3 game and the Puppeteer is basically a uh in the style of Little Big Planet, but it is side scrolling and you can contr you control this character, and I talked about it in one of the uh, last previous episodes, so you can go listen to more of my thoughts on that, but I always wanted to play this since it ever came out, and I believe it came out on my birthday, um, in like 2010, 2011, somewhere around there on PS3, and the style of it is so unique because it's basically presented as a play, so like there's curtains that come come up and go down and you know are on the sides throughout the entire time. There's studio, um, you know, stage lighting throughout the entire game, and each cutscene and, and level is shown as being presented on the stage with an audience watching the entire game, and it's told as a story. So you've got a narrator and you've got the characters sometimes breaking the fourth wall and stuff. It's just it's so dripping with creativity like something like psychonauts that i just went man i love this i love this so much it went on way too long though it was a much longer game than it needed to be <clears throat> the game itself um doesn't know what to call the character the main character that you play as which is kataro kutaro kataro um they the narrator and the other characters in the game all pronounce the um, the main character's name differently. And so I have no idea what his actual name is, and it, it was a little distracting. But it's a really good game. I, I'm super happy that I played it, and I played it around my birthday, which made it even better. Then I played Stray. My wife and I uh, took a long time to play through this because we wanted to play through it together. And... Uh, stuff happened during the summer where my wife had to be away from the house for an extended period of time, which was a real bummer because we started playing this game and then she took off 
<laughs> she she went to go visit family for a, a little over a month, uh, family emergency stuff. And unfortunately, I didn't get to play the game until she got back. And then we finally finished it up, even though it's like a three and a half hour, four hour game. Uh, it took us six hours, but we really enjoyed the world and exploring and just being a cat in that world, which was really fun. So I, I really, really enjoyed playing through that. But it did take a while for us to uh, finish out that six hour <laughs> stray game over the course of like two and a half months. Then we played or I played God of War Ragnarok on the PS5. I really like God of War. I think it was a really fun series. Um, it's one of those series that you don't have to take super seriously when you first start playing the, the series. It's just an action game. And at the time of my life, I, it drew me in because of not only it being Greek mythology, which I love and I've always been fascinated with, but also just the hardcore, you know, seeping underneath the surface this is a man's game this is just dudes ripping heads off and stuff like that just like what you think about like mortal Kombat and things like that so i was all in on that series from the get-go and with the 2018 ps4 game just titled god of war they brought Kratos into a new, more mature um, development. And I really like the character development of Kratos over the course of the series, starting from uh, day one, going all the way into Ragnarok. They, they develop Kratos into a much more uh, sympathetic character. You understand the reason why he's so pissed off, and he'll still get pissed off. And in 2018, he is basically the same gruff character throughout the entire game until the very 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 end because he has atreus which is his son with him through the entire game so you get to um see him as a dad and so you see his heart soften a little bit and then with three or not three sorry ragnarok um picks up a little bit after about a year after um the event. So Atreus is grown up a little bit. He's much more mature. He's not some snot nosed little punk brat that you want to beat, but he's a lot more mature, but still is also a kid. And Kratos is an aging dad at this point, and he knows his time is limited with his son. So you see him teaching much more valuable lessons um, of not always going with your anger and not always just you know, doing the thing that comes first in your mind, but contemplating on the risks and rewards and consequences of, of your actions and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of really good parallels to real life and real life scenarios in this game. And I thought that was phenomenal. I thought that was great. Games don't do that enough. And it did it without being preachy, which is what games do way too much. Like when I was talking about Ollie Ollie World and things like that, there are games that try to preach at the player saying, this is how you need to think from now on. Be better, do better, and all that crap. And it's just like, don't tell me what to do. You're not my, <laughs> you don't get to tell me how to think and behave. That's not what video games are for. So I thought it was really interesting with Ragnarok, the way that the story ended up. I think it should have been two games because it took me almost 50 hours to finish. It took me 43 hours to uh, finish. And it's a long game. It needed to be two games. It was supposed to be two games, apparently, but they just wanted to finish it up. And so they, that's why it took a little bit longer because God of War came out in 2018. And then this is the tail end of 2022 and it, it got finished. So should have been two games but whatever it's it's i don't like using the word enough or a lot but this one is very apt for it it's epic in its scope um moving on to the norse mythology a little tired of it um hearing that it was called ragnarok you know especially and, and it, it features thor and odin and balder and um all the, you know, the Valkyries and all that stuff, which we got too much of in pop culture now because of uh, Marvel and Disney, that I'm, I'm tired of those characters. And I want them to go away for a very long time. 
uh, at least 15 years or so before we have another game featuring some form of Thor. But the way that these characters are uh, portrayed as opposed to the Disneyized Marvel versions, I think are really cool. Very interesting. <clears throat> it's a great game. And then uh, Trail Out. <laughs> I forgot to play this game. Trail Out is a game that is basically trying to be flat out and burn out. Flat out is one of my favorite. Oh, I didn't put flat out on here. Okay. Uh, let me add this to my list really quick because I did finish and I forgot to add this. Flat out is a game that came out on the original 360 or sorry, the original Xbox. And on the original Xbox, this came out at a time in my life where I was modding Xboxes for a living. I was um, just having the time of my life and, and I would have friends over until five o'clock in the morning, stuff like that. And this is a game where it's a racing game, but there's this core component to the racing game where if you hit something hard enough, your care, you are not just controlling the car like in most games like Forza or Horizon or something like that or uh, Gran Turismo where you're not just controlling the car and there's no driver inside. You are a driver and if you hit something hard enough, your driver flies through the window and ragdolls into other cars or a tree or you know the environment. And that gave us so much joy as we played through this this game when we were younger when it came out that we would spend countless hours just starting a race immediately turning around waiting for the cars to come on uh, come towards us and play chicken with them hit them head on and send our characters flying and see how far we can launch our characters through the windshield of our vehicles and we would just die laughing because of the scream that the character ah! <laughs> makes and stuff like that but also because it's just so funny to see a character ragdoll uh, um back then when that was less common then we found out that there's this whole bonus game section of this series where you have the races and that's like the main thing but then you have the bonus games where you're in like this empty stadium and there's like these big you know, dart boards and shuffle boards and bowling pins and high jumps where the whole goal is to launch your character as far as you possibly can or uh, knock down as many bowling pins as you can by launching them uh, out of the windshield. So it added this whole extra layer of, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous, which video games need to lean more into nowadays. Everything's so serious. Everything's uh, so trying to push uh, some sort of political or social agenda that they forget to be fun. This is a fun video game. <clears throat> so every every few years, I'll load up flat out and play some high jump or bowling or darts or something like that. But this time, I wanted to actually play the game as it was intended. So I sat down and I played through the entire campaign of Flat Out, which is all racing. But, and I played through um, the developer's newest game several years ago when it came out, which was Wreckfest. So Wreckfest is the newest game in the, not Flat Out series, but the developer's line of flat out games, physics, driving, and all that. And flat out one has some of the best driving physics in video games, even to date. It feels so good to drive and slide. And you're doing a little bit of drifting, but you're more sliding and angling your car into the turn that it's, it is like butter. It is so beautiful in the way that it controls and feels with the cars that have the different types of shocks and you can, the progression is really good too because you have this amount of levels that you need to, races that you need to complete and you can get bronze, gold or, or bronze, silver, gold. And <clears throat> I wanted to get gold because 
when you get gold, you get more money. And when you get more money, you can upgrade your car or buy better cars and all this stuff. And it's just the, the progression of the game is, is built in such a fun way that it was always feeling like I was building towards something. I had some extra goal outside of just get first place, which is what a lot of games do nowadays. They just do get first place and that's it. But the progression of getting more money and building up more money kind of reminded me of um, Road Rash. The Road Rash series, I remember playing it as a kid and spending all night, like for eight, ten hours, playing through the game with my friend where we sat down and we just you know, continually built up our pool of money. We would replay races over and over again and get more and more and more money so that we can get the best bike in the game. Uh, that's how I felt with Flat Out. It was, the progression is so well done. Oh, it was great. So when I, and again, I tried to do this where I was like, okay, I'm going to just, you know, plow through this series. I'm going to start with Flat Out 1, then go to Flat Out 2, and then 3, and then 4, because I know two is different, but it has some really good, uh, really good bonus games. The bonus games are way better in Flat Out Two than One. So I finished Flat Out One. I got gold in everything except for I think the last two races, which I got silver in because it was just so. It's it is unbelievably tough. I have no idea if I can ever get gold. Um, I tried for a couple hours and I just couldn't do it. So. <clears throat> I played Flat Out 2, and it's such a different game. It feels so different because this was when it was ported to the 360, and it's got the yellow bloom 360, you know, era of color palette to it where it just looks dirty. It feels dirty. It doesn't feel really good. The physics are completely different than in Flat Out 1, and I think Flat Out 1 is just so perfect. It's, it's one of the few perfect games that I would say. And I'm going to... I think I'm going to create a list on on uh, the website about perfect games because people misconstrue what a perfect game actually is. They mean there's no flaws, and that's not what perfect means in the context of video games, especially for me. So I, I want to create a list of what I perceive as perfect video games where I don't think there can be anything that can be improved upon. There are small minor technical flaws or here or there, but basically it's is the best version of that game that it can be. So I played through Flat Out. I started Flat Out 2, and I just could not stand it. And as I was going through the forums of Flat Out 2, uh, discussion forums on Flat Out 2's Steam page, I saw someone post about a new Flat Out spiritual successor called Trail Out that came out on my like right around my birthday this ye last year in 2022, so just a couple months ago that I didn't hear of. And I started looking at it and I went, Ooh, this does sound, Oh, they've got bonus games that take place in this empty stadium that have dartboards and high jumps and all this. So I got super excited about that. And then, um, I found a coupon for it. Uh, so I got it for like 11 bucks and this game called trail out is, uh, the gameplay itself is pretty good. Um, it is a very early build. It's it's it should be. I don't believe it's in early access, but it should be considered early access because the game itself is very technically unstable. There's just a lot of and again, this is another uh, thing that I need to think about how a uh, different way of saying it because just it, it's overused so often. But there is a certain amount of jank in this game that is unacceptable for a game and then also acceptable as well uh, because of the scope of way in the way games are created nowadays. So Trail Out basically is flat out um, in Russia and the story, which, hey, they made a story mode. It's voice acted and all that. It's so bad. It's so unintelligible. It so doesn't make sense. And it's just, it's put together in a way where it's just like, oh, <laughs> I know what you're going for, but you, you need help. You need a lot of help to make this actually good. Um, 
first dra- draft type of writing, um, errors and, and typos in the um, in, in the subtitles. The voice acted lines make no sense um, because it is Russian people, you know, trying to translate it into English, um, but it doesn't translate properly. So sentences don't make sense or characters um, use the wrong inflection or emphasis on certain syllables, <laughs> right? The wrong emphasis on certain syllables uh, where they don't say what they mean or it doesn't sound like they say what, uh, they're meaning what they're saying and stuff like that. And it's just, it is, it's laughable in a way <laughs> because it's like, oh boy, this, uh, this, this gives me the feeling of, you know, import gaming, which doesn't exist really anymore. Um, but man, it's like, you see the intent and I went, man, their intent is spot on. They want to make a modern flat out game, which the series is dormant at this point. It, um, has a lot of issues with the last couple of, uh, series because a different, you know, developer and, and different, um, publisher took over the rights for it and so flat out is it not the same as if uh bugbear who created the series um if they were making it which they made wreckfest instead and wreckfest is a very interesting and, and wonderful perfect game and i think it was like my second favorite game uh, in 2017 because of the way it came when it came out 2018 i can't remember but Trail Out is a really interesting game. I say if you can get it for around 10 bucks, it's absolutely worth it. If you like Flat Out, you have to be a hardcore fan of Flat Out to actually like Trail Out. But if you are, you'll really enjoy it. Uh, I think it's really interesting, but it is, uh, I'd say, watch some trailers, watch some gameplay streams uh, if you uh, are wary of it because it is not for <laughs> is not for Americans, let's say. Then I played Bayonetta 3. I just finished it a couple weeks ago. And this is one of the biggest, dis- this is easily the biggest disappointment uh, of the year in gaming for me. I just finished my review, so I don't really want to recap everything that I just typed out. So if you want my uh, m- more full thoughts on Bayonetta 3 and why it's a terrible game. You can go check out the review on gameordie.net. But to basically recap, Bayonetta 3 suffers because it's on the Switch. It's a technical mess. It barely performs on the original Swiss, so a uh, Switch. So I opted to play it on an emulator and it looks a thousand times better in 4K than it does on in 720p, which is what the Switch does. Um Less than that, I, I think I just heard that it drops down to 480p, 480p um, in handheld mode in certain cases for certain games, which is unacceptable. I'm sorry, that is that is not acceptable in any case. So <clears throat> it's locked to the Switch on underperforming hardware, so I played it on an emulator. And unfortunately, the emulator, uh, because of the way the game's coded, has a um, unfixable bug where the cutscenes desync. So the audio gets out of sync in the cutscenes. So you'll watch someone jump in the air, shoot a gun, and land. And then five seconds later, you'll hear the gun shoot and then, you know, land and the cutscene will play. So the audio gets desynced. There is a way on uh, one of the emulators to basically take VSync off and then back on and try and manually resync the audio. But because of what I played on the original Switch and then switched over to the emulator, I, I the story was so stupid and uninteresting, and the characters are so uninteresting, and and I hate that. I didn't care if the audio was desynced or not. I basically got the gist of it anyways. So I watched all the cutscenes. The audio was out of sync with about a second to two seconds. You know, not enough to where it's like, I might as well watch this on online um, and like bump out and watch the cutscene, which I could have done. I just didn't want to. I, I didn't care enough at that point either. If the game was good, 
I would have cared. I would have pl either played it on the Switch or watched a stream of the cutscenes and then um, then continue playing on uh, in the game. But just the game itself is so behind the times of modern gameplay. Like this game feels like it was designed in 2009 when the original came out. It feels like the exact same game, but looks worse, plays worse, has worse story, worse characters. It's just, it, it's an all around the worst game in the entire series by a country mile. It is so bad that I, I hate played through the game. I am glad I played through the game just for the fact that I did get to experience a couple cool things in the game. But everything about the game is just like, man, you took how many years to create this game? This Like, there's so many things wrong with this game. And the fact that we didn't hear a single word about the game until, what, four months before it was released, if that, like, we heard about it at E3, right? That was when the first thing, uh, and that was in June. So July, August, September, October. We didn't hear about Bayonetta 3 other than it's in development, please stop asking us, for seven years. And then four months before the game comes out, they release one trailer. Then two months before the game comes out, they release another trailer. And then a week before the game comes out, comes out, they have this whole controversial thing about the vo original voice actress who uh, has a huge issue with uh, the fact that she didn't get enough money. And then the company comes out and says, no, we offered you much more. And then she goes, oh, yeah, you totally did. And just makes everyone look terrible, her especially. And it's just like this game was so poorly developed in every aspect, it, they tried to sweep it under the rug, and I understand why. I don't agree with the fact that they did. I would have much rather heard about the issues that was coming so that I didn't bother with it, right? And again, this is something that I'm trying to do with the new year and, and, and learning how to say no, learning how to say enough is enough, learning how to not play through games that are bad, not waste my time on inconsequential things that are bad, you know? Life is too short at this point to have those those things be part of my life. So I am just done with playing bad games, and Bayonetta 3 is a bad game. It's technically terrible. The storyline is bad. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't explain itself either. It's a multiverse story with multiple versions of Bayonetta, and <clears throat> they don't explain anything. They just, it, they, it's like trying to read a novel, but every, every third page, there's five pages missing. So a hundred book page, you know, is a 30 book, or, or sorry, a hundred book, hundred page book is now 30 pages long and you're missing gigantic gaps of information to help you piece everything together. And, oh boy, the new character that you have to play through, and again, have to play through, uh, you, you are forced to play through, is this character Violet or Violetta or whatever, I can't remember. I just don't care enough to even remember her name. But she's this whiny brat character who, uh, punk girl, um, her attitude is atrocious. The way, the way that she finishes, like when you finish a, um, area, like a combat encounter, like Bay in Bay with Bayonetta, you, uh, like you have this like flirty, like kissing the seal and it breaks and shatters. And, you know, it's, it's very Bayonetta-esque where it's like this sexy flirtatious, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, like winking to the characters and camera and, and all this. And it just, it, it feels like, oh, that's that character. All right, cool. And, and it's enjoyable to watch. Like you go, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the character portrays themselves very interesting, uh, interestingly. With Violetta, 
uh, she is so obnoxious that I just want her off the screen as quick as possible. And she's like, yeah, F you, I got it. And it's like this cocky, snot-nosed brat type of character, but she's like a 20-something-year-old. And I just, I want to punch her every single time I see her. Like, I just want her to die. I just want her to get shot in the face, fall off the edge, and never be referenced again. Like, she's a crappy, annoying character. And at the very end of the game, because the way it flows up, it's a passing of the torch story. She's like, yeah, like so the the one character that gets brushed off throughout the entire game, which like it's literally in the first cut scene, the last cut scene. That's basically it. Enzo, which is like the Joe Pesci character for whatever reason. Um, he's like, hey, Violetta, you um, you forgot your glasses. And she's like, don't call me Violetta anymore. Just call me Bayonetta. And it's like, oh, you are not Bayonetta. Shut up. Like, go away. Go die. You suck. It's, oh, it just, it made me just angry that they put that, like, yeah, I'm the new Bayonetta now, and you're going to like it. And it's like, oh, there's just this smugness, this arrogantness um, to the character that didn't earn the name, didn't earn the passing of the torch at all. Like, she's literally the daughter, so she gets to pass the torch, Like, but she has no interesting or uh, good quality characteristics or anything. Like, like oh, my gosh. I, I'm so mad that this game exists. It would have been better if they said Bayonetta 2 was it, period. Like, this game is, the world is better off if Bayonetta didn't, if Bayonetta 3 didn't exist because it's such a stain on the series. It's so bad. There are, however, two unique things that I did think were really cool. I thought the parts where you play as Jean, which is Bayonetta's friend slash enemy slash I don't remember, because it's been so long since, and there's no story recap or anything. Like, this game took so long in development. From the Wii U to the Switch, the end of the Wii U, which was early. So this is basically an entire generation. And they don't recap the story at all. They don't make one moment of, hey, who are you again? Oh, yeah, that's right. We have this history together, or anything like that, that... You play as Jean, and there's this like elevator action type of uh, style to it, or gunpoint gameplay, where it's side scrolling, and you're in an office building, and you have to like go up and down elevators. So it's like elevator action on the arcade or NES, or elevator action returns on the Saturn or arcade, which I love. I love that series. I think it's really interesting. And I, I wish. There was a modernized version of it. It doesn't need to be like 3D open world or anything like that, but like a side-scrolling new retro style elevator action needs to happen. But they they do that with Jean in her levels that you play as her as, and I think it's really interesting. They just don't don't allow for the game to the gameplay to actually work very well. It's very again surface level very surface level get from point a to point b there's all this stuff in between but you can basically just run past it and you should because if you don't and you actually try to play the game the way it's designed it's frustrating irritating and doesn't make a whole lot of sense of why you're doing this because you're being rushed because there's this clock this timer alarms blaring people searching for you and it's just like you need to get out of there but we built this whole thing that you spend two minutes in like hundreds of hours hundreds and hundreds of hours for something that you basically just run past it's just uh, it doesn't make sense the only other good in the only main redeeming quality of the game is there's this boss fight near the end of the game where you summon a demon and it's like this victorian style opera singer she's like got an old victorian style um, dress and she's got like the parasol and stuff and then you do this rhythm game as the boss, and it's it's an operatic song, and it sounds very much and is very reminiscent of The Fifth Element, the movie with the opera singer. And it's just like, oh, dude, this, this is a really cool moment. And that's what Bayonetta is, really, really cool moments. But 
because of the way the game is designed, they don't allow you to actually enjoy the really cool moments. They happen, but you're so focused on not dying or so focused on trying to get a good score or so focused on, you know, dodging something that you don't get to enjoy the spectacle of it. There's gigantic set piece moments, but the game is just set, set piece moments at this point. And it's uh, really, really, really um, distracting. So I played through Bayonetta and the last game that I, I finished was Toe Jam and Earl 3 Mission to Earth. I finally finished and played through Toe Jam Earl 3, the original Xbox. And I played it on uh, an Xbox emulator because I finally it finally got working. And I love Toe Jam and Earl. One is fantastic. Two kind of sucks. Three is pretty good. And then four is uh, the, the ultimate culmination of the entire series. So three is basically one in a... 3d open uh, 3d open world so you have this these hub levels and then within the hub levels you go into these levels and you have to basically do the same thing that you did instead of building up your spaceship parts you have to find vinyl records for lamont the funkopotamus and unfortunately though the area era of when this was made the early 2000s, 2003, this was supposed to be a Dreamcast game. So it was supposed to come out around 2000, 2001, but the Dreamcast was dying. So they moved it over to the original Xbox and it all featured like Toe Jam, Earl, and the new character that you can play as Leticia. Sorry, that's my <laughs> different name. Leticia. Um, they're all hip-hop wannabe rappers so they all speak in early 2000s hip-hop lingo um toe jam talks and says i eat what's up you know you know know what i'm saying and all this just speak that is just oh it's again i don't really use a whole lot of words very uh that a lot of people use to describe everything but this is when you feel uh, it, it, it's so bad. I, I just hate it. I'm, I'm so mad that they went with that direction for those characters. They completely wiped the slate clean with uh, Toe Jam and Earl 4 back in the groove. Uh, but 3 has just this awful representation of the characters. Luckily, the characters really don't make that you know, big of an impact on the actual game itself. It's more the levels and in, in the way you play the game. But it's it's a 3D version of the first game. So you are on Earth, which is represented by floating weird islands that don't aren't representative of real, you know, realistic Earth. It's more of like a dreamlike scape. So you got these areas that you have to convert earthlings with your funk foo. So you've got like these melee blasts that you can convert earthlings into, or you have your ghetto blaster that shoots funkify notes. So you have like this, um, you know, first person aiming a mechanic to it so that you can shoot uh, ranged weaponry of these funkify notes to funkify and, and convert the earthlings so that they don't hurt you. And you go around the level collecting presents in the presents, you know, are either good or bad. You have to get them identified. Um, there's a wise man uh, in a carrot costume that allows you to level up so you get more power, bigger health bar, and um, I can't remember what else. And, oh, and then you can actually, your, your um, funk foo blasts and stuff like that can uh, convert different earthlings. The higher level ups, you know, require a different uh, colored, you know, um, ninja belt. So, like, you start off with a white belt, yellow belt, brown belt, blue belt, and all that black belt at the very end. <clears throat> it's It really is just modernized version of uh, the first game in, you know, Xbox One era, the early 2000s. It's just, it's a shame that they um, spent, they changed the, the way the characters are portrayed as hip-hop wannabe you know 
I, I equate it to Jamie Kennedy and Malibu's Most Wanted. Like, that's Toe Jam. Earl is a little bit cooler. He's like, yeah, what's up? Yo, like Earl doesn't speak often anyway, so he's not obnoxious. But in the cutscenes, it's all three of them together. And um, the less said about Letitia is uh, the, the better, basically. But Toe Jam is so obnoxious. But the game itself is really fun. So I'm glad that on New Year's Eve, I was able to finish up and beat that game. And that makes 36 games that I completed this year. So... I'm a little bit tired. I'm going to have some lunch. I'm going to come back and I'm going to record the rest of this podcast. So again, this is going to be a long one, but I'm going to go through my top 10 games of 2022, which I've talked about a few of them already. So, all right, that's going to do it for me for this. I'm going to take a quick break and I will come back with the top 10 games of 2022. two now i'm gonna get into my actual top 10 game of the, games of the year for 2022 number 10 is a game that started out it came out in i believe 2019 maybe early 2020 i can't I think 2019 a little game called grounded it was on Game Pass in early access for a few years, and it came out during the summer in version 1.0. When I first originally played this game on Game Pass, when it first came out, I was really excited, but I knew it was an early access game. There wasn't a whole lot to it other than the very beginning parts of it, and I just wanted to wait. I, I want to wait a lot of times with early access games because I know if... <clears throat> I play them in early access. Once version 1.0 comes out, I probably don't want to replay the game. I very replay, very rarely replay games anyways. So I wanted to uh, just wait until the game came out. It came out this summer. And what Grounded is, is basically a survival game uh, like Minecraft or any of those types of survival games where you have to... Uh, craft resources and live in the world and all that and create a base but you don't really terraform you don't really do any other than the base building itself which you can do but the main draw for me is the fact that this game is basically the video game version of honey i shrunk the kids from the amount that i played which i dumped probably a couple dozen hours into uh there's a scientist who experiments and creates these uh, characters or these little kids. I can't remember if they're real or robots or whatever. But basically, these uh, kids in a backyard, and they get miniaturized smaller than ants because the ants themselves are gigantic. Um, they're they're actually pretty deadly, I think. I can't remember. No. <sighs> you know, I can't really remember. Yeah, some of them, like I think red fire ants are pretty deadly, but basically you're the size of a small bug or an ant. And you have to traverse this backyard that has these gigantic, massive, you know, 
everyday items like a bicycle or a shovel or a pail or a radio or, you know, all these sorts of everyday little items that we don't really think about in the real world when we're using them because they're just little tools or whatever. But when you're shrunk down to a size that is smaller than an ant, they become these massive, masses uh, pieces that you have to traverse. So just exploring the world was basically all that I needed out of this game. And there's the whole base building mechanic and everything like that too, which I found to be really interesting. However, getting the resources and keeping the resources and gathering more resources to build a base just took too long. And um, at some point I kind of put it down and just never picked it back up again. But I really, really liked Grounded, especially in this year. And like I said at the beginning, over two hours ago, um, this was a bad year for video games. Very rare, uh, very little amount of games, good games came out this year. And so this list is like, I, I struggled to come up with 10 games. I've never struggled to come up with 10 amazing games ever in my entire life of playing video games for a top 10 game of the year. And I've been doing this for a very long time. I've never wrote them down before I think 2008 but since about 2008 I've started doing game of the year uh, just just for myself and then <clears throat> when I started writing blogs and things like that I started notating them and actually taking them down so this is a yearly thing for me and I've never struggled like I have this year to come up with 10 really good games and I didn't even I I had a rule where I'm not going to put a game on a list that I've never completed because if it's not good enough for me to complete, then it doesn't belong in my top 10, right? I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. But unfortunately, because of the way this year went, I didn't, I mean, you heard my list. <laughs> the first part of this podcast was my list of games that I finished and completed this year. There's only 35 of them or 36 or whatever it was. Very few amount of games, and most of them didn't come out this year either uh, for the simple fact that nothing really did come out this year. So I struggled, and Grounded is one of those games that I didn't finish because it's just so difficult to. The reason why is because it's mainly made for multiplayer, and I don't play multiplayer games you can play this and you can finish this single player, but it takes four times the amount of time, which is dozens and dozens and dozens of hours. If you want to build a base and have some resources and not feel under equipped, which I think is the main part of the issue that I have with this game. When you're playing grounded and you're playing single player, gathering resources and gathering all the stuff that you need to feel powerful <coughs> takes a very, very long time. I had such a hard time trying to get ammo or get um, or craft armor or build a base even without it just being a very small four walls. <clears throat> and the game doesn't really help you understand how to do certain things. It took me over, I think, 15 hours to really understand that I needed to, man, excuse me, my throat. <clears throat> I think I, I, I really struggled because it took me over like, I think 15 hours to understand that I needed to analyze and scan a blade of grass, which need, you can't have in your inventory, but you have to walk up and be holding the item to scan it, which you couldn't do with any other item, but you can do it with the blade of grass so that you can build walls for a base. I didn't have base a uh, base for 15 hours of the game because the game doesn't tell you that it doesn't make you, I had to go look up online. I had to watch a streamer play and, and learn how to build a wall in the game because the game doesn't tell you that. And so it's a really fun, unique game. However, it's just, it's too hard single player to actually say, Oh, I want to spend, you know, a hundred plus hours in this game. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the next game that I played, 
Number nine, Stray. Like I said, when I when I played this game, it took us a while to get through it, even though it's a very short game. But playing through as a cat is so enjoyable. It's so fun. I'm a cat person. My wife is a cat person. We just bought a new kitten, um, what, like five days ago maybe? When I just was uh, listening to her cry as I came back down here because she wants uh, food. But we love cats. And so being able to play as a cat is like the main novel thing. And it's kind of gimmicky for this game. And a lot of people, I think, focused on, you get to play as a cat uh, way too much. The gameplay itself is pretty interesting because of the way a cat moves and their personality. There's a lot of little intricate stuff that as a cat person, you totally pick up on notice on really quickly. But there's things like scratching at a door to get someone's attention or rubbing your legs on a person to get their attention or just curling up on a pillow and taking a little cat nap. Like there's these little things that are, you know, the main mechanics of of the game itself and they don't really do a whole lot, but they give the game personality, which I really, really enjoyed. So straight really fun and the storyline itself is like heart-wrenching in a way we did not expect (coughs) excuse me we did not expect the game to move in this heart-wrenching direction the gameplay itself you take on the character of a cat and you get separated from your cat family And basically what happens is you get stuck in this locked down city that has to, uh, you have to find a way out. And there's no humans anymore. They're all robots, but they're very human characterized versions of robots. There's a street sweeper. There's one, you know, uh, who runs a repair shop. There's a a musician, uh, like a, a street musician They're all robots, but they have these human characteristics. And you realize humans died off hundreds of years ago. And these these robots have designed themselves in a way to where now they are basically humans. And your main buddy companion of the game is like this floating robot who doesn't have the memory, who who is not a... uh, not like all the other robots, and you kind of realize uh, through the course of the game, oh, there's a reason why people died out, and there's a reason why this and that. And it all works really, uh, really well together to create a very interesting, heart-wrenching, like, ooh, that hit me in my gut. I feel bad. I feel sad. (coughs) But it is a really, really interesting game, and I thought it was something that I really enjoyed plane. So that was my number nine game. My throat's starting to bother me a little bit, so I'm going to try and wrap this up. I know this podcast has gone on way too long anyways, but like I said, and I always say, I just love talking about video games. So my number eight game is a game called Two Point Campus. I unfortunately didn't finish this game, but I got close to finishing it. Two Point Campus is by the developers of Two Point Hospital uh, that came out a few years ago, which is uh, the developers of the old Bullfrog Studio who created Theme Park and Theme Hospital. (coughs) I apologize. I'm so sorry. So a couple years ago, The old Bullfrog developers created a new studio called Two Point Studios, and they made this new game called Two Point Hospital, which is basically theme hospital from the early or mid 90s, but modernized with a new engine, you know, working on new uh, modern hardware, but a lot of the same British humor. And so you run a hospital and they have all these, you know, um, conditions that that you have to heal people with uh, these various things like egotism and it's not just something like oh they're they're full of themselves they actually literally have heads that balloon up and you have to 
de-egoize them. And I can't remember the actual name of it, but you kind of get what I'm I'm going for. And I believe I talked about this on on the podcast multiple times. So Two Point Campus is the sequel, which I think everyone who played this game <coughs> <coughs> So I think when everyone was uh, getting ready for the announcement of this new game, we all thought that it was going to be the theme park version of (laughs) the two-point universe, as they like to call it. But instead of making a theme park game, they went ahead and basically copied a lot of the same aspects of hospital and made it a university a college campus and so (coughs) excuse me i'm so sorry so as you progress through this game instead of you know creating a hospital and, and curing sick people you are making a college campus so that people can learn different studies so you have like witchcraft and there's like this whole harry potter you know um level in, in in college theme to them you have night school but it's not like day and night night it's night as in medieval nights and so you have like um courses that allow people to learn jousting and stuff like that really really unique and funny like good humor in the game but it leaned too far on the theme hospital uh, mechanics where it just felt like oh this is a reskinned version like a total conversion like old dos games where you would have quake and then you have a total conversion of quake where they would have the x-men and there was a story mode and all this stuff but it, in the core it, it's basically the same game that's kind of how this felt but i dumped like 15 hours into this game and i still had a really fun time unfortunately i didn't get to finish it because i encountered a game breaking bug in it where i was doing the uh witch the witchcraft uh harry potter uh uh story campaign and for and it's kind of near the end too like i was maybe like four levels from the end and these levels take hours to complete so i was a couple hours into maybe an hour into the campaign and i just encountered this bug where an asteroid hits the college and you know some dueling witch like uh is trying to destroy my campus and it uh basically destroyed everything to the point where uh it caused a bug and crashed the game to desktop and i tried for weeks to replay it and it would autosave right before so like 30 seconds before this asteroid hit and, and broke the game um, it would crash the game to desktop and I replayed over and over and over again trying to see if there's anything that I can avoid doing or whatever. <coughs> and I just could not finish the game. So bummed there, but I still enjoyed my time with it. The next game is God of War Ragnarok. And I, I talked about this earlier in the episode, but basically God of War, Fantastic game, a continuation of the 2018, which is, again, a continuation of the entire series, which is really nice. Atreus is a much more rounded and better character. He is not just some sniveling punk brat kid that you just want to beat, but he has a lot of good character traits. Uh, There are sections of the game. It's interesting because you do swap between playing as Kratos and playing as Atreus, and they they their passion, paths branch away from each other in certain times in the game and that's nice because you get a kind of a little breath of fresh air so it's not like the same thing through 40 50 hours of gameplay but the atreus sections there's some parts where you're just like why is this here this is taking way too long like if this was a 20 minute detour fine but 
there is a section where you go off as Atreus for like two plus hours. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the story other than Atreus is having his own side adventure. And the character they in introduced called Anger Boda, <coughs> which is this girl that um, is Atreus's age, and she basically kind of like helps him understand like uh, f the fates. You cannot, you, you cannot do anything about your fate. You ha just have to accept it and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it, she's a cool, interesting character. Her section that Atreus like goes through with her is pretty interesting. But at some point I went, what does this have to do with anything? Like I got the message, like within the first 15 minutes of playing the section, why do I have to continue playing this? And it's just like, wow, if I was going to replay this game ever, which I, again, I never do, so I'm not going to, but if I did replay that game in a couple of years or so, I'd be dreading that section going, oh, I don't want to slog through this. And that's not very good game design. These games also are so linear in a way that um, some people call them Sony prestige games, which I don't think is the right again just like with a lot of other um genre titles and stuff like that i i don't think that's the correct term for the type of game that they're going for but sony really really likes to make one type of game you see it in uncharted you see it in the last of us series you see it in god of war single player behind the character camera um narrative driven focused single player games that are more cinematic, more touring and telling a story that takes um, control out of the player's hands more than anything else, which I don't really have a problem with. I know a lot of people do, but give and take, I'm, I'm fine with it in certain aspects. But for whatever reason, I, I've, worn, I've been worn down and I'm, I'm sick, sick of this style and I need more gameplay than story. And there's 15 minute long cutscenes in certain parts of this game where you're just like, why isn't this a movie? You know, which is, again, it's fine, but there needs to be more at this point. This has to be the last one. You end it with God of War, you move on, you create a new style of game. I can't do it anymore, but the story of this game is so well done and it's, it's so broad and, and expansive too. They hit a lot of notes. Excuse me. And some characters really don't get the time that they need to breathe. Um, Thor is a imposing force, and it's really interesting when you get to fight side by side with him, with Atreus, uh, near the middle-ish of the game or whatever. <coughs> but basically... Um, I think I think the the best and this is kind of a spoiler if anyone is <laughs> uh wanting to not hear this but near the end of the game you have these two characters these true two dwarf characters that are with you from the first game and then this game Brock and Sindri and Brock ends up dying in Sindri who is the more He's the more cautious of the two brothers. He's not as brash. He's not as outspoken. He's very cautious to be kind. He's a very kind character, too. And when Brock gets killed, a switch flips in his personality where he's so done with listening to everyone, accepting what everyone is saying, doing what everyone asks of him. He's just over it all. He's done with it. And I think... His story arc at the end of the game is so interesting that I can absolutely, and I wrote this in, in the write-up for uh, uh, the Game of the Year on the website. So you can go check out game uh, gameordie.net and go to the Game of the Year uh, write-up, and I talk about this a little bit more in detail. But I could totally see Sindri being the villain of the next game where he shows up 
or is pulling the strings at least to get back at Kratos and Atreus for having his brother killed. And it's really interesting too, because uh, you, you learn throughout the game that Sindri is actually the one who actually caused Brock's death originally. And he felt so guilty that he went to the Sea of Tears or whatever, wherever, uh, Helheim or whatever, and brings, Sind- or brings his brother Brock back from death. But he's missing one-fourth of his soul, so he's not fully uh, alive technically. And so when he dies again, his soul, a part of his soul is just straight up gone, so he can never return back to life or, or whatever. So there's a whole lot of, like, he's dead, 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 dead. <laughs> and so there's a whole lot of, like, character development and just the way his story goes is just so heartbreaking in a way that you're just like, wow, this is this is good writing. This is the way to do this. And I do think when you say something like uh, prestige gaming, that does bring especially uh, Sindri's story, it brings such a higher elevated way of telling stories in video games. It is almost like a form of prestige where it is lofty and and a much higher expectation of this is well done. So I, I think that's a really cool, interesting thing about the game itself and the story. And I think the story is phenomenal. <coughs> I just had too much... Um, a little bit too much of the game, especially in the the sections that dragged where it was like, okay, I'm ready to get back to Kratos. I'm ready to get back to the action. I, I know where this story is going. I want to see it to the end. And then at the end, I think the ending's just too rushed, which is kind of by design because like the whole thing, Ragnarok, the world's ending and it's going to be chaotic. But I feel like some characters just don't get their time, their due, <laughs> in the game, which is a little bit of a bummer. All right, so number six is going to be Sniper Elite 5. And I talked about this in earlier in the podcast as well, but the level design is the key thing here, the linchpin of the entire series where you have these massive levels that you are supposed to spend an hour plus in. There's times where I think I spent two hours in a level killing everyone, (laughs) sniping everyone, um, doing as much as I possibly can, exploring in every area that I possibly could because I just enjoyed it so much. And the, the purest aspect of gameplay in it where you are sitting in a tower alone away from everyone, you've got your sniper rifle that is equipped with a, a good scope and you've got a silencer and all that, and you are plotting and watching the enemy target, you know, go about his day in his car, working on his car, going inside, having a sandwich, coming back outside, you know, talking with uh, a couple of lieutenants or whatever, going back, like plotting that out, watching him, and, and then finally pulling the trigger at the perfect opportunity where no one will find his body, no one will see him, you will be undetected and be able to have a perfect, you know, the perfect shot and, and finally executing on that and seeing the, the bullet go in slow motion over several hundred yards. And it's just continually going over, you know, fields and, and past uh, other characters and (laughs) through windows and stuff like that. And then finally hits your target and it goes into the, x-ray uh vision where you see the character the enemy character's eye just pop and explode and and their skull cracks and breaks with the velocity of the bullet you know or you deflate you shoot them in the heart and their heart just deflates like man that is why this series is good and that's why it's number six on my list because is just so so interesting, but the the story not very good. Uh, really, Carl just needs to be killed off. Like I I want a much more interesting character for Sniper Elite Six because 
Carl is just a cardboard cutout. He's so bland. <laughs> Number five is going to be TMNT, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. I love the Turtle series. And even though this game has everything going for it, it has the art style of the cartoons mixed with pixelized art. <coughs> it has the voice actors from the original cartoon. <clears throat> it has an overview map. It has online co-op play. It has a really good soundtrack. Great intro. Everything about this game is fantastic, except for the fact that it is short and shallow. There is not enough depth to this to keep me coming back for more. I sat down, I played through it in a single sitting, a single evening with my friends, and I basically got 100% out of the game. There is nothing that game can show me that I haven't seen within two hours, which is a bummer because I want to be able to go back and play it more. And something like, uh, I said something similar with Streets of Rage 4 where I just went, I beat the game. It's a short game. Took several years to create. Now what? But they did do DLC and stuff like that. So maybe they'll do DLC. I would be really excited if they did. Number four is Infernax. And Infernax is, um, again, it's that, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. Yeah, it's it's not a ripoff. It's an homage and it, it rips off certain aspects where it's like you basically just stole this this uh design, you know, like the day night cycle. What a terrible night to have a curse and blah blah blah. But your character doesn't have the curse. The town does. Your character is not transforming. The town is transforming. And there are ghouls that, sh uh, the different characters, like ghouls and stuff that show up during the night that aren't in the day and uh, other things like that. But a modernized version of that game, which I originally hated, I hate Simon's Quest. I think it's a, a bad game because of the way it's designed, because it's so obtuse that if you don't know how and where to go and, and what exactly to do, you can't beat it. So you basically have to have a Nintendo power or the previous knowledge of how to beat the game. Uh, but I think Infernax is just like, it's the perfect version of that game for modern audiences. And I really, really loved it. Number three is something that I haven't talked about yet because I technically didn't beat it. I... Uh, this game came out at the very beginning of the year. It's called Vampire Saviors. And <coughs> it came out on Game Pass at the beginning of the year. And I heard everyone raving about it, but the way it was described was something that I just brushed off. I went, that's not for me. I don't, that, that sounds, that sounds like a flash in the pan type of game. So when I got really, really sick and I couldn't um, really play or do anything for a couple weeks of my life during the summer, I picked up Vampire Survivors because I was just like, dude, I need something and people are telling me. And I saw a article saying the game's almost finished because it was in early access. And they said, it's, uh, it's almost finished. There's this new update. You know, it, it'll be a few months before it finishes, but... This new update, you know, adds so much fun stuff to it. You got to try it out. And so I was like, you know what? I'll try it out. And I'm so glad I did because I dumped 17 plus hours into this game. And what Vampire Savers is, is basically a single stick a shooter. You, you hear about uh, games, dual or twin stick shooters. <coughs> kind of like uh, Geometry Wars or... Uh, Smash TV, same type of concept. You have a screen, but you actually have a map. The game actually is a very large map, and you can roam around the map. But 
it is single stick. So you only control your character's movement. That is it. You don't actually do any of the attacking. The attacking is automatic and it's on a cooldown timer. So when you start, uh, your first, your only attack happens once every two seconds. So you move around in a couple, and this is just the first level, a couple bats start showing up on screen and they're moving towards you, just like in Smash Brothers or Geometry Wars. So you move around, you have to dodge them until your attack happens. And you have to angle your character so that the attack hits, you know, the enemies. And as you're moving around, then it's on a cooldown time for, for two seconds. And then after the cooldown, it attacks again and then goes back into the cooldown. So you only move. That's all you do. <coughs> and once you are finished uh, moving around and attacking these enemies and they're gone and they're dead, some of them will drop gems. And these gems give you XP, which boosts your uh, level. And after uh, like four or five gems that you pick up, you level up. And once you level up, you have a list of new abilities to gain. And it's always randomized. So one, um, one ability that you get to only choose one out of a list of like three or four. So you can either power up your main attack instead of just hitting every two seconds one attack every two seconds you have two attacks every two seconds so like the first character is a whip so he's got a whip and he slashes once but if you have a whip and you slash or you upgrade it it slashes on one side and then the other and then it goes into the cooldown so now you double your effective attack or you can choose a upgrade, uh, or a, not an upgrade, but a new ability. Like instead of just having your whip, you can also throw a dagger. And so you plan out your upgrades as you get them. So you go, oh, I, I want to invest more into this attack, uh, this single attack, to create two attacks out of it. Or I can still have the whip slash once every two seconds but also throw a dagger in the other direction or have it home or you know whatever or have a shield and as you upgrade your character the upgrades become more powerful more frequent the cooldown timer can uh gets lessened as well to the point where as the you you progress through the level which has a 15 or 30 minute timer on it as you go higher and higher in the time <coughs> of spending through this level, you actually are so powerful and, and the enemies are coming faster and faster and more powerful enemies are coming at you, but you always feel like you have the upper advantage. And it is that very power fantasy type of gameplay style where you always feel in control you feel like you can get overwhelmed, but you still have the upper hand so that you never feel overwhelmed. And it's such a basic gameplay, you know, aspect that a lot of people barely call it a game, which I disagree with. I think there's a lot to it. You have to plan. You have to maneuver. There's hidden secrets. There's different things in different objectives. There's different levels. There's unlockable characters. There's also a outside of the uh, level progression to it as well because as you move through the level you pick up gold and that gold will always stay with you even after you die and, and get a game over and so let's say you pick up 50 gold throughout the level of your run and then you can go into the main menu and choose to spend that gold on an unlock ability that permanently upgrades your character's health or permanently gives you uh, double boost damage or whatever, you know, uh, unlock other characters as well. So there's more than just the move around and dodge. That's part of the game, not the whole game. And I cannot believe I spent over 17 hours in this game. And <clears throat> it wasn't even in version 1.0 yet. It was still in early access. Once it released version 1.0, uh, there's DLC that dropped for it too, which I bought. And I bought the game on Steam. Now, 
the game itself is five bucks, or it was five bucks. There was a sale on Steam for three dollars. This game was three bucks that I dumped seventeen plus hours into, and then the DLC was like two fifty. So. I bought the game because it was on Game Pass, so I didn't even spend any money on it originally. And then I bought the game on Game Pass, and I've just been having a blast with this game the entire time I play it, to the point where I said I had more fun with this game than the majority of games combined this year. So I made it my number uh, three game. I'm going to finish up here quick because... I'm starting to feel a little bit crappy. Uh, but my number two, I feel a little bit weird of, but again, this was such a crappy year for video games that I kind of have to make this. The reason why is because I had such a good time playing this game. Grinning from ear to ear the entire game. And I'm not into this style of gameplay period, but this game series... It does it for me like no other has. It's the DLC for Cuphead, which is called The Delicious Last Course, or DLC, Delicious Last Course. This was supposed to come out in 2018. <laughs> Cuphead came out in 2017. E3 2018, they announced the DLC. And from what I gathered, the way that they presented it, it made it seem like it's coming later this year. So I thought winter of 2018, we were going to get the game or the DLC. And then they announced the Cuphead Netflix show. And I went, oh, we're not getting DLC if ever. Uh, we might get it in a few years if we get it at all. And that's exactly what happened. The Netflix show came out with three seasons, technically one season split into three small seasons. But basically, the show was announced, developed, and put out before the DLC even came out, which was, you know, a year before. So I was pretty mad, pretty upset. <coughs> the DLC was pretty um, pretty cheap from what I remember as well. I think it was like 10 bucks, 8 bucks maybe. Uh, and it's basically Cuphead 2. Uh, there's, it's a smaller game, you know, it's a, uh, different island, which has like eight bosses or something like that, but that's a good chunk. And the story mode that they put in it and the, uh, characters, a new playable character of Miss Chalice, really, really fun. And I have nothing but good things to say about this, uh, DLC slash game. So I made it my number two. <coughs> <coughs> Man, I'm just starting to not feel good. I'll, I'll finish up here. And my number one game of the year, which should be no surprise to anyone who listened to me talk about video games in the year 2022, Elden Ring. Elden Ring is one of those games that I thought I was going to hate. And as I played through it initially and I started playing it, I hated it and I knew I hated it. But something kept me going. It kept dragging me, kicking and screaming along as I played through it. And I hate played through the first part of it. And this is why I don't want to hate playthrough games, but there's still something uh, really satisfying about a game that you initially don't like and you learn to love this is a perfect example in my life of that where I thought I was going to hate this game I only bought it because it was game of the month our discord you know obviously uh, picked it uh, because everyone loves dark souls games I am the odd man out there I hate them and I did not want to give this any attention especially because George R.R. R. Martin was attached to this game because he created some of the characters. I hate that. Uh, I hate that guy. I think he sucks. Uh, and the reason why I think he sucks is because he cannot make a story. Uh, he cannot finish a book in over a decade, even though he's one of the most popular people in the world and had a super one of the most successful TV shows of all time. 
and <coughs> he makes excuse after excuse about not finishing a, a book that everyone for you know over a decade has been wanting. He just can't do it. So I really, really hated the idea of Elden Ring, but I bought it because I said, I am still going to give it the old college try for whatever reason. And I ended up loving it. I thought it was just a really interesting game from the fact that it takes the Dark Souls mechanics, the genre of Dark Souls, and broadens it, opens it up, allows you to explore, allows you to tackle um, the, the different environments on your own, at your own pace, the way that you want to tackle them. And I really thought that was very interesting in a way that Dark Souls never allows you to do. I still don't agree with the um, the fact that you have to... I'm losing my train of thought here. I apologize. I still don't agree with the, the fact that uh, the enemies respond every time you save. The world is always going on, so you can never just pause the game. Like, there's a ton of stuff uh, that I disagree with. But the core concept of going in this open world, doing what you want, when you want, how you want, and the traversal, which uh, they give you a horse uh, so that you can actually move through the gigantic environments very quickly, and the fast traveling and jumping, having a jump button really, really helps too so that you can maneuver around characters a lot more Uh I think is phenomenal. And I think from the time that I beat that first little uh, mini boss, the bridge troll at the very beginning of the game, that's when I went, ooh, there's something to this. Okay, I, I kind of get it now. To the point of burning down the Erd tree, I think that is a perfect game. And I I want to kick myself for saying it, but I really do think it is like, this style of game has never been done better, and I don't think it ever will be. I don't think I, I can't think of anything to improve upon it. <coughs> that being said, the ending of the game is terrible, and it almost ruined my entire experience and in, in, in feelings on the game. I think the floating crumble city in, in tornadoes and whatever is atrocious. It really soured me on the game. It just went on way too long, and the the boss rush mode at the end just made me want to chuck a controller. Uh, and I wasted a good chunk of uh, a couple, uh, uh, about a week of my life on the ending of that game because it is just so stupid. So Elden Ring, with a reluctancy in my voice, <laughs> Elden Ring is definitely my game of the year for 2022. Which brings us to today the new year 2023 is <laughs> funny because uh over the last several days i've been watching a lot of um reviews of of game of the year discussions and things like that and and seeing a lot of people talk about the new coming year and their hopes and expectations i got to uh, the end of the year of 2019 and watching everyone say how excited they were to try new things and do new things in 2020. And we all know how that panned out. Uh, and then watching the next video of game of the year and going, and, and just everyone just looks like they're, they're about to kill over and die. And just the, the tone in their voice of, Oh my gosh, what, what did, what just happened over the last 12 months? I thought is uh, pretty funny, <coughs> man. I am so sorry. I, did not think I was going to start uh, hacking up along here. But to to finish out this podcast with this gigantic, you know, couple hour long podcast to reiterate kind of my hopes and, and desires for this next year, 2022 was a really bad year in gaming for the fact that so many games were delayed. So many games were pushed back to the next year, to 2023. And... Just looking at the amount of massive games coming out this new year, I'm excited. 
I'm really excited about playing a lot of these games that I, I feel we should have gotten a couple years ago. I hope they're all good. I don't want any of them to be bad. I'm excited to uh, branch out a little bit and play some new stuff. I'm excited to um, change my mentality of gaming to not hate play through uh, games, not finish games that I am not enjoying, sticking with the games that I love, not sticking with the games that I don't, um, trying new stuff and just generally overall, you know, trying new experiences. I'm, I'm really interested to see what this year holds. And I hope that with this new year, I can do a lot of cool stuff with this podcast, with uh, the other podcasts that I run, the Couch Money podcast. And, you know, hopefully I can get some new uh, listeners because I just love talking about video games. It's my main hobby. It's the thing that I love doing. And I just want to share that with as many people as possible uh, to to an extent. I don't want to focus on, you know, a streaming so that a fact that I can get more followers. I'm never going to be a numbers follower. I'm never going to strive just to bring numbers up on viewerships or count at all. I don't listen or I don't follow. I don't care about any of that stuff. If you listen and you like what I say, awesome. That's all that that matters to me. I do not... Um, I do not care about the fame or money or monetary value of this podcast or anything like that. I just want to talk to people about video games. That's really all that I want to do with this. So I hope this next year has a lot of cool, fun, interesting stuff. I'm very excited for the possibilities. I hope I achieve the goals that I'm going to set out uh, for myself this year. And if I meet them, awesome. If I don't, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, this is a hobby. We should be having fun. We shouldn't take it so seriously that we lose sight of the main reasons for it. But that's going to do it for me. I have been your host, Ryan Moore. This has been the Game or Die podcast. If you want to uh, check out the write-ups for all my games, I also do reviews for every game that I beat. So um, I also I, I try to do that and update that as much as possible. I did something really cool this uh, last December, even though I was pretty sick at, near the end there. And I also had a ton of other extra stuff going on in December. December was crazy uh, just for me personally. But I did a, uh, I, I dubbed it retro And instead of having a game of the month, I did a, um, a generation. <laughs> I did 16, eight and 16 bit. And every day, I played a different game and wrote a little, you know, a little blurb about that game and what it means to me. And so from December 1st to December 31st, I played a new game every day and wrote something about it. And it's on the website. So you can go check that out at gameordie.net. Um, but I just want to say thank you for everyone who listens to this podcast. Again, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope 2023 is an awesome year for everyone because I think we all deserve it at this point. All right, that's it for me. I'll catch you next time.